Praise be Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to hear a story? It was the night before the Normandy invasion, D-Day, and a brave young paratrooper is making a night jump, and he gets blown off course, and he gets tangled up in a tree. And from midnight till sunrise, he's fighting cold and he's fighting despair. And as the sun emerges in the east, he's glad to see a church in the distance. And eventually, two friars emerge. And he calls out to them. He says, fathers, can you tell me where I am? And the friars go off in a huddle for about half an hour. And they come back and says, yes, we can tell you where you are. You're in a tree. And the soldier said, oh, you two must be theologians. <laughs> so, well, that's right. How did you know? Well, because you've told me the truth and it hasn't helped me. <laughs> oh, I say this as a philosophy professor. We can do better. We can tell the truth. We can tell the truth with clarity and charity and then offer the natural and supernatural helps to live that truth that seems to be so obvious, doesn't it? And doesn't it seem to be the only meaningful definition of the pastoral approach? And yet, people don't understand why I'm here, why you're here. A few days ago, I was having dinner with a group of unusually well-informed Catholics. Well, what are you doing this weekend? And I explained where I was going, and one of the fellows, you could see him kind of searching his memory for what, what is that Courage International thing. And then he said, oh, isn't that the group that wants people to abstain? <laughs> it reminded me of when Benedict XVI was in Africa and he dared to speak the scientific and moral truth that latex doesn't work like magic. And people lost their minds. And when the Harvard AIDS Prevention Project director said, no, scientifically, Benedict XVI was right, and the spirit of inclusion, tyrants, tolerance, and dialogue, he lost his funding and got fired. A self-identified Catholic institution within driving distance of this building said, uh, the health director there said, well, we're, of course we're a Catholic school. We're just really glad there's a pharmacy across the street so our students could get the condoms that they need. What does it mean to need a condom? Now, Father, who was the uh, assistant director of the healthcare, said, Benedict has to understand people are human beings. You can't expect them to abstain. Oh, well, I hope that led to a fascinating and lively conversation with this bishop, but that's not for, for me to judge. Look, we are made from love, and we are made for love, and we live in a fallen world, and sometimes we want things that are not good for us. We're sinners. We're loved sinners, and we're sinners. Always the two together. If it's love, 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 then we're in Sunday school in 1970s and we're making banners announcing that Jesus is the butterfly who never dies. And that doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> On the other hand, if we're just sinners, 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 then we're just Calvinist Jansenists. And that's, then we're not invited to any more parties, and rightly so. <laughs> so how do we learn? How do we make it a matter of habit? to rightly value what is rightly valuable. Well, that engages our intellect. And how do we learn how to desire what is rightly desirable? That engages our heart. And then from there, as a matter of habit, please God, we have to choose the right means to the right ends. That's a matter of practice. And habitually choosing the right means to the right ends, we attain our ultimate destiny. Well, what's that? Well, let's go back to my earlier statement. We are made from love. There is no good reason for the infinite creator to create finite creatures. There's no payoff for him. We don't add anything to him. See, if I give you a birthday present or a Christmas present, you have to exist before I can give you the present. But when we're given the gift of existence, that's an absolute gift because you didn't exist before you got the gift. So we are rooted in this absolutely wildly generous love. 
And God can only want the best for us. And the best for us is himself. So we're made from love, we're rooted in love. That's the source of our dignity. And we are destined for love, perfect, infinite, absolute love. That's our boast, that's our, our vocation, something that, that the pagans could not have imagined, something that the moderns could never understand, and something that the postmoderns couldn't even articulate. And that's why you have somebody, me here, like me here, talking about this important topic, rather than somebody smart and famous, and I'd add more expensive, uh, somebody, <laughs> uh, somebody like Jordan Peterson. All right. I mean, God bless Jordan Peterson, obviously a smart man, obviously a very stimulating conversation partner. But look, he does not stand on the foundation of Christ and the one church he founded. And if we're going to get human life right, number one, we have to stop doing what the world does, which is digging the hole deeper. And number two, we also have to stop building on sand like the world does. Christ and the one church he founded is the only foundation for a humane society. The choice is always either Christ or chaos, and anything else is hand-waving distraction and whistling past the cemetery. So when I was asked to talk about discernment in the service of friendship, Jesuits love to talk about discernment the way Franciscans like to talk about Francis. It, it's what we do. But there's a lot of background to getting discernment right that isn't talked about as often, and that's what I want to talk about today. Right? We're made in the image and likeness of God. That means we're rational, we're free, and therefore moral, and we're also, like God, social. We're communal. We have a desire to give ourselves, to pour ourselves out, and to be received. And we have a desire to receive another. Human life is a recapitulation of the life of the Trinity. We're made to be social. We are made for love. And if we get love right in this fallen world, if we loved sinners get love right, if we let ourselves be hollowed out by virtue and suffering, we will enter into eternal life with a larger vessel to draw from the fountain. If we live a mean life, if we just try to game the system, if our highest aspiration is to just get the last seat on the last bus leaving for purgatory, we're gonna go to the fountain of eternal life with a shot glass. Where somebody like Father Harvey, God bless him, is going to show up with a keg because <laughs> he practiced virtue and he suffered. And he was a happy warrior. And I talked to him, and he was shot in the back at least as often as he was shot in the front. And he never complained. He never spoke a bitter word. He was not a resentful man. He always had the joy of the Lord. And that's the work of human nature and grace cooperating together. And that's what God calls all of us to. I was trained in metaphysics. I, I love foundations. All the postmoderns within earshot just screamed. I, I love foundations. And for St. Ignatius, the first principle and foundation, if you're a Star Trek fan, this would be the prime directive, all right. The first principle and foundation is man is created for the praise, reverence, and service of God and thereby to save his soul. So we are to judge absolutely everything, whether it's morally indifferent or absolutely praiseworthy in terms of does this move me, this particular individual, to the happiness of heaven for which I am made. So Ignatius says, long life, short life, doesn't matter. Sickness, health, doesn't matter. Wealth, poverty, doesn't matter. Right? Single, married, consecrated, doesn't matter. What matters is, am I living in a way that's conducive for the end to which I was made? And anything that fits and helps with that is good and praiseworthy. And anything that doesn't fit, 
what Ignatius would call a disordered affection or a disordered attachment, we have to get rid of. It's an encumbrance that will rob us of the happiness of heaven. And all of our discernments have to be made on that foundation of the first principle and foundation. Now, who wants to get in right at the ground floor of our lives and take us away from that foundation? Satan, what Ignatius would call the enemy of our human nature. See, we are adopted sons and daughters of God. We are heirs to an eternal kingdom. We have a matchless identity, dignity, and destiny, and Satan wants to inflict us with amnesia wants us to be like the prodigal son who at most can expect to be a servant and never a son. And he only has one lie. Satan is a one-trick pony. goes right back to the Garden of Eden. You know, God's holding out on you. God doesn't have the best for you. He really doesn't like you. But I can cut a deal with you because I understand you. I know what you want. And I know what you deserve. Satan is always whispering that. Whispering, whispering, sometimes shouting, usually whispering. And then you say, oh, I'm right, yeah. Um, I'm not happy now. I'm miserable. This God thing doesn't seem to be working. What do you got? And then we're led by the nose. And we live in a world that facilitates that. We live in a world that is already drunk on the blood of its young, a world that insists we can only be happy if we love things and use people. That's the world we live in. We have an economy based on that, surely. And we're never satisfied. What's the Latin root of satisfied? Satis facere, to be made full, to be made complete. I remember as a, a high school boy reading a book and it was about a, a young man crying out for God and the words of the author that he put in the words of the mouth of God still stuck with me at 40 years later. God says to this young man, I am what your bursting is towards. It's inelegant, but it's brilliant. I am what your bursting is towards. We don't live in an absurd world. We, we are not all dressed up with no place to go. All of our longing is meant to be fulfilled. All of what we're made for, to know the truth, to love the good, to delight in the beautiful, we have a taste for eternity in this life that prepares us for eternity in the next life. And the work of Satan is to derail us from that. And the genius of St. Ignatius Loyola is to give us an awareness of how the lies work, of how the seduction works, how the derailment works, so we don't have to fly blind. My, uh, my mother had a very complicated health history. By the way, if you ever hear me speak of my mother, just think of Sophia from the Golden Girls, a little Italian lady. That's what my mother is like. And she... Uh, she had a complicated health history. She had heart surgery. She had a stroke. She had a mastectomy. She had another stroke. And my father retired early and was her primary caregiver for 15 years, day in and day out. And sometimes they were, and you can't fake that kind of love. You can't fake that. And that's the grace of the sacrament at work for sure. Well, there were times when they were not out of one another's eyesight 24 seven. That's a lot of togetherness, even for a happily married couple. And one point at dinner, my mother and father, again, had one of those days where they were in eye contact all day. And my mother said to my father, well, how was your day? <laughs> uh, he said, well, you tell me. You were there for all of it. But there's a lesson for us, isn't there? Right? We open our eyes, and it's Sunday morning, and we wonder how we got there. And then we blink, and it's next Sunday, and we have no idea how we got there. There was a lot of commotion and noise and expenditure, but we rush past the graces, we rush past the opportunities for gratitude, and we consume and distract ourselves and medicate ourselves against the pain of living thoughtlessly and godlessly. 
And then we are absolutely astounded that we're miserable. What's the path to happiness? What is the essential ingredient that not only the world cannot give but doesn't want you to know? Everybody loves a secret. Here is the secret. You will not be happy in this life and you will not enter the joy of eternal life unless you live a life day by day where you stand before God and say, you are my enough. You are my enough. If you don't live your life, if you do not order your life, and believe me, this sinner is pounding his chest. I'm not throwing stones. There hasn't been a, a membership drive for the Immaculately Conceived Club in a long time. <laughs> All right. But you, be sure of this. You have to live your life giving Christ every opportunity to be the first satisfaction of your heart. You have to give Christ every opportunity to be the first satisfaction of your heart. So your mind will be in alignment with the truth of Christ, and your heart will be in alignment with the love of Christ, and you will live a life where you take up your cross, follow him in his bloody footprints, knowing that Christ crucified is Christ risen, is Christ reigning even now, not just at the end of time, and ultimately Christ returning. And so when you approach with that satisfied heart, with knowing who you are and whose you are, then you can approach another in friendship, not from need and not from lust, but from fullness, from overflowing. The best chastity speaker in the world is, is Pam Stenzel. I'm a huge fan of hers. And she says people who have disordered attachments he said, they always find each other. They're like two ticks and no dog. Meet my needs, meet my needs. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to suck the life out of each other, all right? That's not friendship of any kind. That's dehumanizing, and that friendship can't be chased. And as Father Harvey would say, it's not just grim, white-knuckle abstinence, mere abstinence. It's an integration of the whole person mind and heart and body that leads to freedom and it leads to peace and it leads to fruitfulness and it leads to joy and ultimately it leads to the happiness of heaven. So you start with that first principle and foundation. I made for the praise, reverence and service of God and Christ is my enough and I will order my life to give him every opportunity to be the first satisfaction of my heart. What a wonderful thing. And then I can begin to approach from overflowing, from fullness. I can share rather than consume. I can receive without being greedy. What wonderful freedom. What wonderful freedom that is. That's what God, our Lord, intends for us. That's what the world, the flesh, and the devil would steal from us. And we have to be on our guard, on our guard. And we have to tell the truth with clarity and with charity that any other path leads to misery and worse, much, much worse. So how do we begin to live this? How do we make it work? Well, there's no substitute for prayer. Every person I ever know who ended up in a really bad place, myself among them, started with cutting corners with prayer. And not just a perfunctory checking in, but a, a being still and being with and listening and searching for the face of Christ and his heart and spending time with him so that you get to know his authentic voice. To spend enough time with Christ that when you hear him, it's received in your soul like water hitting a sponge. Quiet, peaceful, fruitful. And then when the enemy tries to lie, it's like water hitting a stone. 
When I was four years old and I wanted an extra cookie that I knew I shouldn't have and I tried to play cute with mom, and I crawled up on her lap and I batted my eyes and said, Mommy, can I please have another cookie? Blink, blink, blink. And my mother looked down at me and said to me in Italian, quando la diabla la carizza vuole la anima, which means when the devil caresses you, he wants your soul. That was mom. <laughs> That was mom. Mom was no joke. Mom was all business. <laughs> but there's a wisdom in that. See, the world will tell us that we can invite Satan in and cut a deal and be safe. That somehow Satan will be satisfied with being only a junior partner. And that never works. What do you think is going to happen when you invite the hungry dragon into your heart? He will demand to be fed, and he will rage when you choose to starve him. St. Ignatius Loyola said, no good work can be done without the world being set in an uproar and hell's legions roused. Let me say that again. No good work on earth can be done without the world being set in an uproar and hell's legions roused. See also the life of Father Harvey, and look at the history of Courage International. There are powers and principalities and persons who hate what we do and what we stand for because it is a liberating truth and a healing truth and a saving truth. Christ is enough for the human heart, and from his fullness, we can bring his fullness to others. What's the hallmark of spiritual maturity? What's the litmus test? And St. Ignatius is very succinct, very clear. So the hallmark of spiritual maturity is this. When you can look at any creature and no longer love the creature in its own right, but only in relation to its Savior and Lord. In human relations, what does that mean? when you can turn to someone and say, because of who God is, and because of who you are to God, I choose to love and serve you. Because of who God is, and because of who you are to God, I would never see you again rather than hurt you or dishonor you. That's the hallmark of spiritual maturity. And that is a key component of discernment in the service of friendship. When you love the people whom Christ loves and you love them as he loves them, which is to say with humility, generosity, and chastity, when you only desire their good and nothing else, that is when you are truly free for friendship and for love. I spent a lot of time working with college students, and every year these 19-year-olds are convinced that they've invented romantic love. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they all think that I was found in an envelope by the side of the road, <laughs> labeled Jesuit inside, had water and stir, and this man with glasses and gray hair emerged ex nihilo. <laughs> And then when you talk, talking, say, Father, you had a life before you did this Jesuit thing. All right. But they're always asking me, I hate this question, Father, how far is too far? <sighs> you know, you're dealing with God who loves you. You're not dealing with the Internal Revenue Service. I'm not H&R Block to teach you how to game the system <laughs> so that you can get away with as much as you can and give as little as you can get away with. That's not my job. Well, and then I just say, don't play with the fire, you'll get burned. Don't play with the fire, you'll get burned. Father, can't you teach us to play with the fire safely? No, there's no such thing. Fire burns, it's what it does, that's its thing. I can teach you to build a fireplace, but you're not ready for that. So I say, and, and, but they're not satisfied with that. So I say, look, how far is too far? When you cause yourself or another to want more than what you should have, when you cause yourself or another to want other than what God wills for you, 
then you've gone too far. That's too much. It dishonors you, it dishonors the other person, it dishonors God. Step back. Well, Father, that's no fun. Well, you know, I visit enough prisons and hospitals and morgues, and I've made enough phone calls to parents in the middle of the night to know being chased is a heck of a lot more fun than ending up in a hospital, prison, or a morgue. Let's act accordingly. You know, and if you don't do it for yourself or the love of God or your parents, do it for me, because I didn't start with this gray hair. Which one of these has a name on it from an undergrad? So rather than trying to game the system, rather than trying to look at the rule book, calculate, if we only change this paragraph in the catechism, then everything will be okay. Well, no. No. Because human nature doesn't change. And the beginning of wisdom is to name things as they are. Yeah, oh, gosh, Father Harvey, he'd say, you know, if you think about human persons and human bodies and the parts and how they fit and what happens when they fit, there really is only one sexual orientation. You might have a whole panoply of preferences, but there really is only one orientation. Let's start with that. And we have to call shenanigans on the nonsense. Why is it that I've discovered an orientation and now I announce that I'm born that way and that's the end of the conversation and you're a hater if you want to continue the conversation. But male and female, I can go to jail in some countries if I say you were born that way. People lose their jobs in the National Health Services in the United Kingdom saying, no, really, you were born that way. It's in every part of your chromosome. We have to start by telling the truth. The truth is we're made for love, we're made for friendship, we're made for intimacy, we're made for communion. Ultimately with God, this life is a dress rehearsal. We get it right and help each other get to heaven, or we get it wrong and we help each other get to hell. And those are the only options. There is no other option. There's no third thing, there's no tertium quid. There's no playing around in the middle. And the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking, and God is watching, and so is Satan. So friendship and love is not a game, and it's not a hobby. It's a preparation for heaven. Humility is rooted in telling the truth. Right? If Luciano Pavarotti said, I'm going to be humble by announcing I'm a bad singer, you'd say, no, you're a bad liar. You're a great singer. Humility is rooted in telling the truth, and the truth is God is God and I'm not. The truth is God is holy, and I'm not. The truth is God is righteous, and I'm not. And the truth is I am called to spend eternity in the presence of the all-holy, all-righteous God. I've got a problem. There's, I need to get to a destination, and I can't cross that bridge myself because I burned the bridge down with my sin. My sin not my fault, not my quirk, not my picadillo, not my little oopsie, my sin. And I deserve separation from God. And the cross of Christ proves that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, would rather go through hell for me than go to heaven without me. And we have to preach Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ reigning, and Christ returning. And that is our hope. So we start with, I am a loved sinner. Always the two together. I am a loved sinner, and I am not an orphan. I am provided for. The, the grace necessary for salvation is available at every moment. Every moment. God is not stingy with grace. Father, it's really difficult being chased. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Have you prayed for the grace? Yeah. I said, you know, if you stop breathing, would you pray for air? Well, yeah. And I said, well, this is how we need to pray for grace. Yeah. I want you to remember three Latin words. A lot of things are better in threes and even better, better when they're in Latin. Um, and these are virtues that will help you to live what courage is about. 
so that you can make proper discernments about friendship in light of the love of God. And the first word is docilitas, docilitas, from the Latin dotrede, to, to teach. So to be docile means to be teachable. It doesn't mean to be merely passive. It means to be active learner. One of the reasons I gave up teaching undergrads is I was tired of interrupting my lecture with, this is the part where you write down what I say. And they're kind of <laughs> astounded by that. Right? The fact that you're here proves that you have docilitas. You're eager to learn. I can read it in your faces. God bless you for that. The second virtue complements the first. Winston Churchill tells the story of a man who falls down a long flight of stairs, lands with a loud crash, picks himself up, dusts himself off, looks over his shoulder and says, oh, I wonder what all that noise was about. <laughs> God forbid you, you treat your time at courage that way. You go to this fabulous meeting and then you, you pull out of the parking lot and you forget everything. All right? So the second virtue is memoria, memory, an accurate memory not just for happy reminisces, but because you've got to put to work what you've been taught here. It's gotta be ingrained in you. Something like, our, ponder as Our Lady did, ponder these things in your heart. Savor them, suck the marrow out of them, recite them, pray litanies of what you've learned here. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to mug you from an angle you don't expect. And that's why you need a third virtue, which is called solertia. S-O-L-E-R-T-I-A. Solertia. Really hard to translate. Some people call it sagacity. Eh. It's the ability to think on your feet. It's uh, what an Arkansas friend of mine said, good old-fashioned walking around sense. You know. The difference between a kung fu student and a kung fu master is when you try to mug a, con a kung fu master, the solertia kicks in and doesn't even try. You know, my sister happens to be a kung fu master. I'm one of the few people in the world that says, if you're mean to me, my little sister will beat you up. <laughs> yes. So I text her every day, how are things today? She says, well, I went to the grocery store. Somebody groped me, I broke his hand. Oh, I gotta make lunch, see you later. <laughs> this, very matter-of-factly, very matter-of-factly, that's solertia, rather than, ah, you know, and just reached back, broke his hand, and went on with her day. And we have to have the attitude, the skills, the plan, so when we're tempted, and you will be tempted, when you're lied to, and you will be lied to, and when you lie to yourself, and you will, this is the voice of experience talking, trust me, right, you'll know what to do, and say no, this lie does not conform with the Christ I met at Courage this weekend. The wisdom of the world is not in harmony with the wisdom I found at Courage this weekend. This friendship, this opportunity for love, I'm approaching from need rather than the fullness of Christ. So I must step back. This person approaching me for friendship and love is asking me to be his Christ rather than his friend. I have to step back. See, if we're not in harmony with Christ and the church he founded, we're going to have a need that nothing and no one in the world can fill, and we're only going to do damage when we ask someone or something to fill it. And if we're invited to love and friendship with someone who doesn't know Christ, we have to start evangelizing because he or she's going to need something that we can't possibly give no matter how hard we try, no matter how well-intentioned we are. So what's the moral of the story? What do I want you to remember? What's the takeaway? You are already teachable, because you're here. Memory, accurate memory. Make a little plug for the sisters here. Get the CDs, get the DVDs, take your notes. The solertia, that readiness to act, that comes from prayer and reflection and conversation with like-minded friends. So when it's time to bear witness or time to resist temptation, the time to make a good yes or a good no, you already know what to do and you won't be taken by surprise. The world, the flesh, and the devil tell us 
that chaste relationships are not possible. And even if they were possible, they're not worth the effort. And they will tell us, they will tell us that there are really safe and entertaining alternatives. Well, I'll put parentheses around the entertaining, but as someone who's taught medical ethics for 25 years, I can tell you for sure it's not safe. Right. So let's not be lied to. Let's not tolerate the presence of lies. Let's name the poison of lies for what they are with clarity and with charity. The best preparation for the life of heaven is a life here and now rooted in Christ, rooted in chaste friendship, where we can say, because of who God is and because of who you are to God, because of who God is and because of who I am to God, I choose to love you and serve you chastely and in no other way. And I will gladly and humbly receive your love and friendship only to the degree that it is chaste and no other way. Here's what I want you to remember. Chaste friendship is an opportunity for all. Chaste friendship is an obligation for all. Chaste friendship is a liberation for all. And if we live chaste friendships, and I believe lives will be saved, and souls will be saved, and best of all, God will be glorified. May God's holy name be praised now and forever. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father. Would it be all right if we took some uh, questions? Oh, absolutely. Very glad to, yeah. Thank you, Father. It was a wonderful presentation. Thanks be to God. Very inspiring. Uh, have you had this conversation with your colleague, Father James Martin? <laughs> well... And what was the outcome of that? I lived with Father Martin and Father Tom Reese for a year back in 0203. So it was before Father Martin was Father Martin. Uh, but no, his paths, we travel in different circles, so our paths haven't crossed recently to talk about this. But I would say for anyone, if you really do have a, a heart and love, Christ-centered love for people with same-sex attraction, I don't know why you're not talking about Father Harvey and courage. There may be a good reason, I just can't think of what it may be. So I would say the measure of your love for people with same-sex attraction is being in harmony with Christ and his church. Father Harvey and Courage, and courage do that. So that's what I would say to anyone. There you go. I'll be happy to take other questions, and I'll be personally affronted if there are no other questions. Uh. Hi. Um, in addition to what I do with Encourage, mm -hmm. um, my whole passion for over 25 years mm -hmm. is self-education and mm -hmm. formation mm -hmm. for all our very weekly catechized <laughs> I have to say, this is a comment, not a question. Mm -hmm. Hands down, this is absolutely one of the best presentations I've ever heard. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me recommend a little book to you by Joseph Pieper, P-I-E-P-E-R. It's called A Brief Reader on the Virtues of the Human Heart a brief reader on the virtues of the human heart. He's, um, his little meditation on purity will make you weep with joy. When you read those few paragraphs, you could say, how could a sane person not want to be pure? It's a profoundly lovely book. Everything he does is sublime, but this one in particular, if you're gonna read one, a brief reader on the virtues of the human heart. Very, very highly recommend. And if you want to be a ninja against relativism, Francis Beckwith has a book called Feet Planted Firmly in Midair. Okay. And then pray for me, I have a philosophy book called Real Philosophy for Real People Being Evaluated by Ignatius Press. Please pray that they accept that.